I am a Belgian. Uh, I've been living in Thailand since 2003. But the big news is I'll be going to work for SMART, the labor mutual. Some people are here in the back, and they will actually speak today. Um, and so I'll be working 100 days a year for SMART for the next three years, and I'll be in Brussels November, December, and every springtime uh, for the next three years. So uh, for me, it's a bit of nostalgia, you know, to be back and uh, eat uh, chicken gratin and, and all these things that uh, I love about Belgium. Um, well, anyway, thank you for inviting me, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks especially to Bram, I think it's a really stellar program. If I can keynote, that can be bad, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. So basically the subject of my talk will be um, if, the, if there is a shift from the kind of politics we used to know, which were very much a politics driven by labor and capital uh, contradictions, some others, you know, national contradictions. And in Belgium, for example, we had uh, atheists versus religious people. So we had these different contradictions, but the main one, I think, was labor and capital. And the kind of ongoing struggle between should we go more lib or should we go more lab? And kind of a pendulum in the last 200 years, every 30 years, uh, society is moving to one polarity or the other. Um, and of course, in the last 30 years, we had been in this lib uh, part of the pendulum, privatization, etc. Um, and so I think there's a new element, uh, the commons, and I, I do want to explain a little bit what we mean by that. Um, so my work is very much based on a relational grammar. There's a few people who have written about that. One is Alan Page Fisk, The Structure of Social Life, but especially I like uh, Kojin Karatani, The Structure of World History. And just the very basics, uh, there are four ways of allocating resources, of relating to each other, um, and that's the commons, the original one. When we were small nomadic tribes, uh, property didn't make a lot of sense. You have to carry everything you own. So um, the things were put in the common, in the family, in the clan, etc. Once we complexified our civilizations, we moved very much to reciprocity. Um, so if you're a nomad, you can travel around, you can avoid uh, fighting. Once you are uh, in a fixed in a village, standardized, then reciprocity is the mechanism, the gift economy to keep the peace and extend the area of peace around you. Then we have uh, the state. Uh, nobody really knows how it came about because for 100,000 years we didn't have one. Uh, so the gift economy societies were pretty much uh, knew how to avoid uh, state formation. But uh, at some point, you know, this is like a, a foundational myth. We don't really know. But one tribe decided to survive. It had to conquer another. And then, of course, reciprocity doesn't work anymore. You need uh, coercion and redistribution. So the redistribution logic of, of state societies based on ranking and these things. And then finally the market. So we always had mixes, but uh, I think we can read history in this kind of way where it sees one mode dominates the others and forces the other to, to function in the image of the dominant mode. And of course today, certainly in the West, the dominant mode has been the market. And the whole debate has been state and market. Okay, so what is the commons? The commons is mutualization. The commons is putting things in a pool and relating directly to the pool. So in reciprocity, I give you something, you feel you have to give me something back. In the commons, I write a piece of software, free software for Linux. Nobody specifically is going to give me something back. But I profit and benefit from the mutual benefits of collaborating in this whole in this totality, which is the commons. And so the commons is defined as a shared resource that is co-created by a community of stakeholders and that is governed according to the rules and norms of that community. So in this sense, it's very different from the state and different from the private uh, logic, right? So it's a mode of governance, it's a mode of action, it's a mode of property. Very quickly, because I only have half an hour, the main history line. 
So we started with natural commons, irrigation systems, mountain slopes, uh, fishermen dividing up their, you know, what, what time of the year they can fish in what part of the ocean. Uh, but of course, under capitalism, the commons have been enclosed. The natural resource commons have been enclosed. And the typical feature of our current system is the division between the people that work and the people that own the means of production. So that's still true today, even more than ever. Uh, in other words, the natural commons have declined, certainly in the West. They still exist. I don't know if you know that. One third of the land in Galicia is still a commons, for example. Uh, in France, there is an association of les sections communaux, 100,000 members. So they're still in the Pyrenees and there's still commons around. Um, but the commons of capitalism have usually been social commons. You have to think about the workers. The farmers were driven away from their land. They're uh, coming to the cities. They have no security. And so the commons that we build under capitalism were social commons, cooperatives, mutuals, etc., etc. The third phase for me is the digital commons. That's when, with the networks, we, we start relearning what a commons is, certainly in the West. We start cooperating, we start using open source software, open design, open knowledge, and we are building global open productive communities that um, where basically, uh, you know, we recreate a new kind of commons. Uh, recently, I did a project in Ghent, uh, asked by the city to uh, think about evolution of Ghent as a city of the commons and how the relationship should be between the citizens and the city around the notion of the commons. And I just want to very briefly tell you what I learned there. First of all, that there is an exponential rise of urban commons. So this, we know this in, in Holland. There is a report called uh, Homo Cooperance. Tina de Moor has calculated it. Oikos had done it in the Flanders. Um, I know from Catalonia in, in certain books you can pretty much guess it's the case there, like uh, Aftermath from Manuel Castells. Uh, but in Ghent it was very clear. We had a timeline questionnaire. There were 50 in 1996, uh, 2006, sorry, and there, were f and there are 500 today. So there are now urban commons in every area of provisioning, whether it's mobility, whether it's shelter, whether it's food, especially in food, whether it's energy, you will find an exponential rise of common-centric citizen initiatives. Um, so that's the first conclusion, that it's there and it's growing. Second conclusion, that the structure of the urban commons are very much like the structure of the digital commons. Let me briefly explain. You have at the core of the constitution of the commoning of, of the commons, you have a productive community which is open. So we used to have closed membership organizations. That was the thing when I grew up, you were a member of a union, member of a nonprofit, member of this or that. Today, if you actually read the literature, you can see literally that these new urban commons have the same attitude as a digital commons. In other words, everybody can contribute, everybody come in, and everybody has, who is contributing has a voice in that commons. So the, the global open productive communities are at the core uh, also of the urban commons. I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, it's not very visible, but uh, it's in the middle here. Then what we find in digital commons and we also find in the urban commons is infrastructural organizations. Most of these commons rely on some kind of organized structure that enables and empowers the cooperation, that maintains the infrastructure. So just to take the example of Ghent, uh, one of the things they do well in Ghent is you know, temporary usage of empty spaces. Uh, usually they say it's for eight months, it ends up being for five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, for example, um, how do you say that in, in English, les friches? You know, the old industrial areas with old factories and empty, empty land. Um, so you have this land and lots of projects um, emerge on that land. But you will see that the, there is an organization called DOC, DOCSAT, I think it's called, I forget now, uh, which is the infrastructural organization. But they don't tell anybody what to do. They just create the conditions so that anybody can use this area and this land. 
Um, then what we see is, and similar with the digital commons, we see that in order to survive, in order to maintain the commons, people start try, try to do generative economic activities. So they don't only want to rely on subsidies, they want to become autonomous over time, and they start to um, think about their income and how to create livelihoods. A generative economy, as uh, distinguished from an extractive economy, is uh, an economic entity that thinks, how can we maintain the commons in a fair way? How can we respect the natural resources that we're using, etc., etc.? So they have this particular attitude toward their project, and most of the time, the same people. So people who, who created the commons then say, you know, how can we um, maintain this and, and make a living? So for example, in the dock in Ghent, you'd have a group that is experimenting with mushrooms and how they can take toxic uh, sludge out of the ground. And then they have a little company and they continue to function. And some of them, interestingly, actually now move from one temporary site to another. They become like a permanent temporary uh, infrastructure. This is uh, very interesting. So these three things you will find in the urban commons, a for benefit association dealing with infrastructure, a open community and a, a generative um, economic activity. Of course, you can also have extractive uh, economic activities, but I'll, I want to focus here on the um, positive changes. Okay, so, um, so what we did in Ghent was uh, mapping 500 projects, uh, building a timeline, having a questionnaire. We met 80 different uh, founders and leaders of these commons, uh, and we had nine thematic workshops on um, mobility, shelter, etc., etc. All right, so what we did with the P2P Foundation, the first 10 years was actually, you know, I didn't know it, but now, now, now I know what I was doing, was uh, commons market institutional design. So we're looking at how, how does it work? How, does these, how do these uh, global open productive communities, how do they function? How do they deal with the challenge of existing in a capitalist society uh, while maintaining the commons? So this was our focus. And let me just say a few words about that. So if you're interested, there's a little booklet we wrote last November. It's called Value in the Commons Economy, which is a study of open and contributive accounting. So one of the things that is really a marker for the changes in a value regime is the change in accounting, right? The first writing was a ledger in Sumeria. That's the origin of the state. The temples were managing the, you know, the rice coming in and going out and they needed to write down what came in and came out. So this is the origin of accounting and of the state system originally. Uh, in the 15th century in Florence, Venice, we have the invention, uh, maybe a bit earlier already, of double entry book accounting. This is the birth of capitalism. And the birth of open and contributive accounting for me is a marker of a commons economy. So what are the challenges? Well, imagine a, a, a quadrant, I like quadrants, um, positive and negative externalities, social and environmental. So this is what capitalism does, right? It does two things. One, it does not recognize positive externalities. So Facebook makes a living through our exchange. It doesn't recognize that as being value that should be rewarded. We do it for free and then they make their business model, right? They don't recognize positive externalities. And we actually now have a capitalism that, actually, that works like that. They don't hire workers and then sell the products at a higher cost uh, than what they paid for it. They let us work, they let us exchange Airbnb, and then they extract from our interaction directly. So this is a new form of capital that is actually commons oriented in an extractive way. Uh, negative social externalities, inequality is not our problem. Uh, if you if you're, uh, work uh, that way, but also environmental uh, waste, in, unless there is a legislation, is not our problem, uh, but also biocapacity. We don't take into account positive ecological constraints, like what kind of natural resources in, in, can we actually use to maintain the health of the planet, right? And so if you want to survive, this is what we need to do. We need to integrate in an economic system 
these externalities. So open and contributive accounting is a way to recognize positive social externalities. And you have to imagine a bit like the monks in the Middle Ages, right? So I'll do it for you. Stop. Here stops the Roman Empire or the Frankish Kingdom. Here, internally, we follow the rules of Benedict or whatever, right? So internally, there's a different value regime within the productive community, even though they have to survive in a feudal society, and they have to adapt in many ways, but they always maintain internally a different value regime. And this is what commons communities are doing. They're, they're, they're creating a membrane around their activities, and internally they try to do it differently. Um, another example is reciprocity-based licensing. Um, and this is a bit controversial, especially with people who are really strong and open source. But reciprocity licensing, the idea is very simple. Knowledge should be free and shared, but commercialization can be conditional on reciprocity. And I think this is going to be very important if you're in the social economy, the solidarity economy, if you're an indigenous tribe working uh, with herb, medicinal herbs, you open source is not enough because it means even though the knowledge is shared that all the value will will leak and be in the hands of big multinationals as is the case today with free software um, so this is designed for commons market cooperation if you if you still follow me right so what we did in ghent and this is going to be my conclusion is to explain the potential for public commons design how can we design institutions that work for the commons. So if we move from a situation what we have today, capital, state, nation, right, in which everything works for capital, all the, the state institutions and everything works for the benefit of the market, how can we imagine a society, a civilization where the market and the state, all these other functions work for the commons? That's, that's my way of thinking. So it's not a way of thinking of saying, well, everything we have now will disappear, because if we look at the history, this is not how it worked. These different modes of exchange have always existed in different combinations. We've never succeeded in having just one. So the question for me, if we want to be realistic about it, is how do we design a new combination, which is not capital state nation, but is commons, generative market, and partner state. This is the language I use for this. So this is the way to think about it. So, Okay, here's the first uh, idea. Um, so this is part of a 70-page report that you can read online. It's been translated into English. Um, and it's basically very much inspired by what happens in Bologna uh, and 140 other Italian cities. Yes, I should also tell you, that was a previous slide, that we actually can see that the public and the commons are very much interconnected. So in Ghent, what did we see? That the city, the region supports infrastructural organizations. That the city with infrastructural organizations is incubating uh, commons projects. That the city and the region are supporting commons projects. That the city with the commons projects are incubating generative uh, projects and are supporting these generative uh, entities. So we see it's already happening, but the problem is fragmentation. Fragmentation from the commoners and fragmentation in the, the city, uh, from the side of the city. For example, you have permaculture west and permaculture east. And they don't know each other and they don't talk to each other, which is really strange. They're both connected globally with you know, global knowledge sharing uh, communities, but they're not talking to each other, even in a small city like Ghent let alone that the guys who are doing Renewable Energy Co-op are not talking to the community land trust. So even though they are all commoning, they don't have a joint language and identity that allows them to mutually align and become stronger around this, right? Now, this is, I forgot to say it, but it's very important. Every time a civilization has been in overshoot, which happens in every elite system every time, it's not an exception, it's the rule, and there's a book about it, it's called Ecological Revolutions and the Actual Religions. In the past, every time a civilization was in overshoot, there has been a return to commoning. 12th century Japan was totally deforested. 
you had a reform of the religious orders of Buddhism, like Nichiren Buddhism and stuff, and the land became a commons of the emperor, and 300 years later, everything was green. Yeah? China, you probably know the story, when the five fleets came back in 1471, uh, the emperor had totally destroyed Manchuria, totally deforested Manchuria. There was a revolt against the emperor. They closed down China. 300 years later, China was restored, right? So this is a pattern that we see in history time and time again. So think about the monks. What do they do? They share knowledge at a European scale. They were the engineers of the time. They mutualize infrastructure, and they live like the ruling class at the cost of the lower class, right? If you look at the monastery, they're beautiful buildings, they have a room, they have a bed, they have a warm place where they can work. They don't live like the poor uh, peasants. They actually live like the ruling class, but at the cost, at the footprint, because of mutualization, which is very, very low. So this is the thing we have to do to date, and we, we are doing the same. Open source, free software is mutualization of knowledge. Then we have in the so-called, often so-called sharing economy, but the mutualization of infrastructures is an ongoing process right now. And we have the relocalization of production, what we call cosmolocal production. Everything that's light is shared universally and everything that's heavy is done locally. There is a report, because nobody believed me five years ago, but now I'm really happy that uh, Capital is saying it in my place. A report from ING predicting a 40% drop in world trade in the next 30 years. So this is going to happen. This relocalization of production is uh, going to happen. So these three things are key to you know, having a biocapacity compatible economy, right? So that we know that we are only using what we can and we're not destroying the planet. So public commons institutional design, I hope you can still follow me. Uh, so very basically, uh, how do we defragment? How do we support these processes? Uh, well, a city lab as an intermediary where citizens can um, ask for support for their projects. Uh, the next step is a commons accord, which is a uh, agreement between the city and the common centric community, communities. I'll give you an example, a silly example but I love it. Uh, there is a park in Ghent, Drie Masters Park, in Meurde Meulestede, one of the 25 uh, neighborhoods. And it's a fantastic park. It says collective good when you come in. It's run by the neighborhood, and they have pigs. I think it's fantastic to reintroduce animals in the city. I'm so happy to see that. And you see the children, the elderly. You know, it's an ethnic neighborhood, so it's, uh, these people care for their park and they care for the animals. But of course, you know, from the city point of view, you know, there's that book seeing like a state. Of course, they think everything that can go wrong, right? So, oh yeah, yeah, but in six months you will abandon the pigs and da da di da da da. So this is, this is how they think, right? So what does the Commons Accord say in this case? That the city accepts the pigs on the condition that the people will care for the pigs. It may, may be a bit banal as an example, but this is what happens in these uh, situations. Very important is, you know, regulations. So in Ghent you have community land trust, you have uh, co-op, uh, wound co-op, uh, cooperative housing, and you have co-housing. So mutualizing the land, mutualizing the buildings, and mutualizing the services within the buildings. So th this all exists, this ecology exists, this ecosystem exists. It's marginal, emerging, but it's there. But they sent me seven pages of obst obstacles, right? Because the legislation has been made for the public-private. Public housing, private housing. For example, students cannot have collective housing. One student has to be responsible for everyone. And that's a problem, right? Not everybody has the trust that everyone else will behave. So there's no room in the current regulations for this collective management of a house. And everything is like that, right? Since Napoleon, we have really kind of cut out the commons from our legal thinking and institutional thinking. And this is what we have to go back to. Okay, then the city acts as a facilitator of, coal, uh, of support coalitions. So generally, uh, I propose public commons generative. 
So in a particular case, for this particular commons, what do we need from the public sector, from the civic sector, and from the generative economy? Maybe ethical finance players want to invest. Um, just a little idea, circular finance. If you can determine that a commons project actually lowers the footprint, for example, organic farming, CSAs, uh, diminish the cost of depollution of the water by 80%. Yeah, and 30% less healthcare costs. This is things that are spent on negative externalities which the market doesn't recognize. You can use that to fund transition initiatives and, and create a virtuous loop. Okay, very quickly. Um, there's three slides. This is the second one. This is also a bit uh, maybe too complex to look at, but um, um, so this is basically the structure that I propose to manage the transition, the eco-social transition, the common-centric eco-social transition. And it's based on what they're already doing. So in this case of Ghent, they have a Ghent en Garde, which is the food policy of the city has integrated the demands of civil society. So it has to be fair, ecological, local. I think that's it. There are five of them, but those are the three main ones, right? And there is a food council in Ghent, which within the climate change and the SDG uh, logic can propose uh, policies to the city. And what's interesting in Ghent is that they actually integrate the commons. So, and this is, this is important because this is about the future of our democracy. We all know representative democracy is in some kind of crisis, yeah? And we have Trump and Brexit and all of that. This is very serious because we have an authoritarian system. I just come back from China. I was 10 days in Shanghai. And we have a biocapacity hegemon that is, that is growing, right? So China doesn't care about the money. When they go to Ecuador, where I was for six months, they make an agreement and say, we'll build the railways, and you pay us in grain and oil. They don't make contracts based on money they go straight for the biocapacity, for the carrying capacity of thinking ahead. But they're authoritarian. And in the last Congress, they had 30 times the mention of socialist ecological civilization construction. Yeah, they take that very seriously. There are provinces like Guizhou, where there's a footprint report, that have very, very successful in diminishing the footprint, even in a system like the Chinese system. So we are in trouble, right? We have an authoritarian system that succeeds in doing a transition, and we have democratic systems in crisis electing people who deny that there is even a problem. So this is related to the problem of representative democracy, but here is the, the problem. So in the, in, the, in the logical representation, they have to integrate the Bourenbond in the council. The Bourenbond is one million members in the Flanders, I think, and they're the farmers who are toxifying our soil unfortunately. So of course, when you talk to them about organic farming, they use language like Kötterbuchkes, I don't know, I, can, I cannot translate it, but it's like pejorative. You know, the insignificant organic farmers, right? This is how they think. They think this is not realistic, etc., etc. Um, so the representative logic is, is a problem, but they actually have integrated the Werkgroep Stadslamba, which is the workshop of city agriculture, and these are the commoners. And in the commons, you have a voice through your action, yeah? So you should make a difference between representative democracy, participative democracy, and contributive democracy. They're different logics. And somehow we have to make them work together because I don't think it's a good idea to abolish uh, representative democracy. I think we need democracy plus. We need a super competent democracy that integrates civil society more directly. So when we say public sector, what we should mean is actually the public. Right? This is what it actually should mean, not a state that encloses uh, common goods. Um, so the participative logic is seen by many citizens as top-down. The, the, the city facilitates, organizes, come Monday morning when everybody's working, uh, usually. Um, so it's, it's not seen as entirely positive. And the city is often going to frame participative, participative processes. Contributive democracy has its own problems because it's based on a cognitive and cultural elite. 
in order to lead commons initiatives, you have to be, you know, most of these people are educated. They're not everyone either. So you have another problem, right? So it's going to be, but the, the advantage of the contributive logic is that the city is forced to recognize those actions that it self-proclaims it wants to do. So we have state and market failure, but the citizens are doing renewable energy, are doing organic farming, are doing everything we need to live within the biocapacity of the planet. And this is, this is the, the interesting part of it, right? If the city can recognize that citizens are actually already doing what it claims it wants to do, then it should recognize this contributive logic. And so this is done again basically by integrating the contributive council within the representative council. Sounds complicated, but kind of works. And basically, very simply, what I propose is to extend this to every transition area. We should have a, a, a mobility council, a, a shelter council, and, and, and sustain and expand the commons in those areas. And what's not working yet, this is what you see there, it's the Assembly of the Commons and the Chamber of the Commons. It's working in France, we have a dozen uh, Assemblies of the Commons, and I work with the ones in Lille. Very advanced, very active, uh, very, you know, creating connection between the, the co-working space, the Fab Lab, and, and the uh, city agriculture. But this is not working in Ghent yet. Uh, so we still have difficulty in getting that extra step of seeing, it. and this is for me the role of the commons, right? Is to create a narrative that permits mutual alignment in the, in, in the transition. And so basically what I propose is that you, you know, we are, most of us here will be workers, you know, we, we don't live from our rent, we live from our work, pro probably. Um, is basically to take a step and say, no, no, I'm a commoner. Yeah, as a citizen, I contribute to the common good. I'm a productive citizen, I create value, I'm a commoner. And so this is an identity that's not there, even though most people are actually commoning, but they don't know it. You know, in your family, I bet 90% of you are commoning. You, you're not asking money for the services that you do for your children. Some people do, but I think they're crazy. Uh, but anyway, right? So you're commoning without knowing it. You're speaking prose without naming it. And so, if we look at the history, you know, the history of the English working class from E.J. Thompson, we see that being a worker wasn't a given either. These people thought they were farmers, they were expelled from their land. It took three or four decades to shift them to this identity of being a worker. And so I think this is what we need to do now, is we need to use the commons as this unifying narrative and a new subjectivity. We are contributing to the common good, as a citizen, I am productive. Yeah, I conspire, I, even through breathing, I, I create relationships, I build value. Um, anyway, so I think I pretty much uh, um, finished my story. So at the P2P Foundation, we try a little bit to live, uh, to walk our talk. So just briefly explain it. Um, we are with, only with 12 people actually working full time. We organize in five streams, advocacy, visioning, operational, community, and research. Uh, and each stream is autonomous and we use Lumio, an open source decision making system to come to you know, legitimate decisions because we are a bit everywhere. And that works very nicely. Then a project has one or two or three coordinators that are responsible for carrying out a project. Uh, so we make a difference between processing and action. We don't want action to be always subjected to uh, you know, endless processing. So we make that difference. That's a choice we, we make. And then we have two live pods, which is basically two groups of six people taking care of each other. And taking care of each other is very simple. We don't actually give money to each other. We're not ready to do that yet. Uh, and all, most of us are actually precarious, so it's not easy to do. But we look out for each other, meaning, you know, when there is some income uh, project, generating project, we look at each, you know, we know who needs it, we know who can do what. And so we went from one person in 2014 to 12 people in two live pots today. Uh, and everything we do is a common. So all our knowledge is put uh, in wikis, in blogs, 
with open source licenses. We actually use the peer production license, which is a reciprocity license. So at a very small scale, we try to do what we talk about. One word about smart. Uh, I'm sure you, you will have Lisa talking. So today we have this big distinction between precarious workers and salary, right? And we, every big change in history has been an exodus, yeah? From slaves to serves, from serves to workers. Today, from salaried workers to precarious workers. This is the big shift. I think only one out of four people in the world has a normal job anymore. And so, uh, the reason I joined SMART is because it's a labor mutual. It's a way of people that are precarious but want to be autonomous. So this is not about imposed uh, you know, uh, precarity. This is about people like me. Who, I don't want a job. I want to be free in my choices. But I also want to make a living, right? So the, the, the capacity to create a mutual guarantee fund, to create a salary status for autonomous work is, I think, very important. This is why I joined SMART. Uh, I just started two days ago, but I just wanted to say, tell you, explain you why I did this. Uh, and it's commoning. Labor mutual is commoning. It's a social commons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe there are some questions or comments. Um, comments. <laughs> we have time for one, two, three maximum um, comments on the comments. Uh, <laughs> Michelle. Um, if not, I would like to ask, um, do you have a question over there? Hi, uh, I was just wondering how is the concept of uh, the comments and this new approach, how is it being interpreted and received by um, uh, progressive pol political uh, movements, particularly Marxist oriented who are already and have been for the last hundred years um, trying to figure out how to get uh, 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 to, to, to find a new system uh, beyond the capitalist one, and is especially interesting to people today. So how is the standard, more standard and older, but pro very progressive systems reacting to, your, to this proposal? Um, I would say, quote unquote, with difficulty. Um, well, first of all, you know, for let's say the reformist uh, people, the social democrats, uh, which are not a Marxist, but I, I do want to explain because this is very important. If your logic is that value is created in the market, yeah, and only in the market, and then you redistribute it afterwards, then of course if you take things out of the market, that's a problem. So, you know, socialist parties have trouble with this. Like, oh, are you demonetizing? This is a bad thing because then we don't have taxes and then we don't have redistribution. What we say is we're not for redistribution, we, for, we are for pre-distribution. So instead of ignoring externalities, which is what the system does today, and then afterwards repairing it or redistributing it, why don't you do things in a generative way from the start? So this is you know, a different way of thinking. For example, we want to recognize contributions, right? So if, let's say, uh, uh, this is for my friends, uh, actually in the P2P Foundation today, guerrilla translation, right? They translate for free from English to Spanish and Spanish to English, text about the commons. Then some company will say, oh, don't you want to translate this book? So in other words, there's a market activity Two people are going to earn money, but it's based on the global uh, collective effort. And you cannot solve this only with the market. This is impossible. So you have to have a contributive accounting system and say, whenever we create income post facto, because we're actually doing it because we want and like it to, then we agree with each other that we will distribute the income in a different way. So in the case of uh, Guerrilla Translation, it had a double accounting. And there's a very successful, it's actually a capitalist firm in many ways, Ethos Foundation in, in, in England doing that. They have 
So this is, they are not, you know, this is not left-wingers, but what, what they do is very interesting. So if you work for the market, you get paid. But if you work for the network, you get virtual shares. And every five years, they double the number of shares so that the people with virtual shares who created the common, the common good of this particular network actually get the value they created. Um, yeah, I, I think for, my, for my, my, you know, I used to be a Marxist myself, you probably can hear it because I have a kind of a structural understanding of the world. It, for me, I know, I know this is not a scientific answer, but I, I'll just like to say it anyway, because I, I'm sure many of you know divorce. So let's assume you have a relationship and it doesn't work. Yeah, it's an abusive relationship. As long as you keep fighting, you're putting energy in the relationship. And then there's a moment when you feel, fuck, sorry, uh, this is not going to work, right? And you lose interest in the fight. And if you're lucky, you'll find another partner. Uh, so this is the way, another way of thinking about it. So I think for me, the, the reason we use post-capitalist and not anti-capitalist is because of that. It said, you know, we are not fighting for another form of industrial society, right? Because I think looking back at what happened, for me, socialism was just another way of dealing with capital and labor. People got salaries, there was capital, it belonged to the state, there was, were consumers and producers. It was another way of organizing industrial society. Um, and I do think a lot of Marxists are stuck, for me, in that image, you know, labor against capital. For, and for me, labor is a category from capitalism. So if you want to go out of it, then I, even though we might still be laborers as well, you know, we have to add the commons. You know, maybe I'm labor because I have to, but my positive identity is actually the commons. I'm a commoner. And so I have great difficulty explaining this to, to classical you know, Marxist people, yeah. One more. Hello. Um, I was wondering uh, what, what you think about uh, blockchain maybe uh, being an interesting uh, infrastructure for, for the commons. Yes, I, I'm of two minds. Um, so, you know, basically I, I think we are in a struggle for a vision of humanity. Yeah? And we have capital in the market, you know, the sovereign, and they want us to be subject, so they control us, they surveil us, etc. There's a second vision, which is anarcho-capitalism. And they want everybody to be a capitalist trader. So they want a market, you know, a kind of horizontal market. And so the blockchain, for me, is very much inspired and has a value-driven design that is mostly done by these kinds of people. And so they're not about the commons. They, they use the commons, you know, it's open source, but they use the commons so that everybody can be a capitalist, a micro-capitalist. So if you think about it, the, the Bitcoin, which is associated with the blockchain, is designed purely in an extractive logic, right? You go in early, it's designed to gain value, and so through speculation, you make money. You make money with money. This is not a generative currency. It has its uses, but it's not a generative currency. Same with the blockchain. The logic of the blockchain is that because, you know, so people who do the blockchain don't trust people and don't trust governance, right? They don't trust people talking to each other. So the machine has to do it. Trustless, trustless machines, trustless algorithms. And so because they don't trust anybody, the way that the blockchain works is that every transaction has to be verified across the board. So the problem with the blockchain is that it's also ecologically extractive. It's very hungry for energy to do that. Okay, all this being said, uh, if we have nothing else, you know, I'd be happy to use the blockchain for shared supply chains, for example, right? To, so we have a market economy, we have a planned economy, but the commons is a mutual coordination economy. What we do in open source is we have 
everything is open and everybody knows what to do by looking at the totality, right? It's a holoptical, stigmergic, sorry for the difficult words, system. So we already have mutual coordination in the free software economy. What I want is to have this in the physical economy. Through open accounting and shared supply chains, we can have open source circular economies where everybody can see what everybody's doing. And we don't need necessarily the price mechanism or planning decisions. You know, it can be, we create a framework like a biocapacity framework, and within that framework we know what we can use and we see what everybody else is using. So that's the kind of idea. But there is a project that's called the Holo Chain, which is redesigning the blockchain with generative principles. They're not ready yet, but I, I support these kind of people. Also, the Economic Space Agency, which is building a Commons DAO. Uh, also, Faircoin, Faircope, not perfect in my view, but uh, it's also progress because they introduce democratic governance and different kinds of mathematical proofs to lower the uh, ecological cost. So for me, blockchain is not the end, it's the beginning, right? It's a proof of concept, it can work. Like Bitcoin, it proves that virtual currencies can work, but unfortunately, it's a very extractive, hyper-capitalist uh, currency. So it doesn't solve the problems of the commons. And, but we know it can be done. We, but we really don't know yet exactly how we can do it differently. That's, that's a problem. You know, I would like it to be faster, but no, it's uh, not done yet. Okay, th thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Saya Solier, thank you.